Hello everybody, this is Dr. Novak. In this video, I, uh, I watched a few videos and when I watched them, there was a little misinformation in the videos that uh, I thought ought to be brought up and try to straighten out the misinformation that was brought up in the videos. So in this video, we're going to talk about the two different ways of denitrification. Is one way better than the other way? And that's coming up next in this video. Okay, if you look at the chart, which I've shown before in other videos, uh, it, it shows you the complete nitrogen cycle of how it really works. Okay, if it's not working proficiently, then you will end up with a byproduct of nitrates, which we all know. Then, of course, we're all told that if you have nitrates, then you're going to have to either do water changes to get rid of it, or you're going to have to use plants to get rid of it. But we know this is not 100% uh, accurate. Okay, it's what you've been told, but it's not accurate. And what we know is, I've been watching some videos and these two ways of using a uh, denitrification process is one was talked about with Father Fish and the other was talking about myself. Father Fish uses a deep sand bed which does assimilatory denitrification. On the other hand, I use a process of low oxygen level called anoxic conditions, still oxygen level, and that is called dissimilative denitrification. Now we know that we have the nitrogen cycle and nitrosomatis aeropia is the bacteria that will break down ammonia into nitrites. We also know that nitrobacter when a Gratzkii will then break down nitrites into nitrates. But when you have this end byproduct People think that plants are going to use it all up, and that is the way it's always been told to us. In the videos, they explain, for example, Dr. Fish, deep sand bed, four inches. The videos explain assimilatory denitrification, and this is, happens in anaerobic zones, meaning these zones have no oxygen. Oxygen has been depleted. And in this zone is anaerobic heterotrophic bacteria. It reduces nitrates back to ammonia. Now, in some of the videos, it says it will reduce nitrates into nitrites. But this bacteria kind of acts like plants do, where plants will take nitrates, bracket, break it down into nitrites, and then break it down into ammonia, which becomes a food source for its amino acids and proteins, okay? These anaerobic heterotrophic bacteria that I'm talking about, these bacteria will turn around and they will take the nitrates and through a two-step reduction process, much like that of plants, break it down into nitrites, but it doesn't stop there, and then break it down into nitrates. And this would make a lot of sense, because when you have a zone that has no oxygen, you have other things going on. Inefficient use a phosphorus for energy. So these bacteria are not very efficient users of phosphates. Okay. And they result in an abundance of phosphates. They also cause another problem, these bacteria. It's called fermentation. And these bacteria begin to form making sulfate reducing bacteria or methogenic bacteria that all are caused in this anaerobic zone, void of oxygen. This would make sense. 
making ammonia. Now, if anybody remembers, and I got, I'm going back a little bit in time here, that a long time ago, before they had things like Huggies and and Pampers and stuff like that, long time ago, uh, you used to have baby diapers made out of cloth, and you would have a diaper pail, and you would clean them and, and throw them in the diaper pail, the diapers, and that's how it was because you didn't have the plastic ones today where you just uh, throw them away. Anyhow, that diaper pail would get full, and then when you open up the lid, it would just reek of ammonia. I mean, it would reek of ammonia. It practically, you know, make your eyes water. It's like, whoa, you couldn't wait to close the lid to the diaper pail. Imagine that happening in your substrate. And that's exactly what is happening exactly what is happening in that substrate. You are creating ammonia. You are not creating nitrites. You are creating ammonia because that heterotrophic anaerobic bacteria breaks nitrates down into nitrites and nitrites down into ammonia. Now if that ammonia re gets released back into the upper substrate, which is aerobic, now that bacteria will see that ammonia and have to now break that down into nitrites and then back into nitrates. Hopefully this process of the monkey chase the weasel kind of process you're doing here will not disrupt the aquarium or throw off the equilibrium of the aquarium. Unfortunately, it does happen and the equilibrium does go out of balance with these aquariums. So, as like Father Fish would advocate with the deep sand bed, is hopefully plants would bring oxygen down into the substrate, and this would oxygenate the substrate enough so you wouldn't cause assimilatory denitrification, assimilatory denitrification. And that's what you're hoping for. Does it happen? No. We found this out even with uh, the Germans when they came up with heating cables at the bottom of the aquarium. The heating cables work great. You'd have a deep substrate, heating cables through convection. You would take what's in the aquarium, move it into the substrate. This would bring oxygen, native water into the substrate, and keep it from going anaerobic. The problem is... What do you do in the summertime when our homes are already 78 degrees and the heating cables never turn on? You start building up anaerobic zones and anaerobic bacteria. So, and then, of course, heating cables aren't that reliable and dependable that I used them and they actually broke down. Like all heaters do, it's a man-made product. It's a mechanical product product it has mechanical problems so they break down and that's what happened to me the heating cables broke down now what do you do your heating cables are no good you have to tear the whole tank down pull out all the heating cables replace all the you know it's what a hassle really it's a pain in the butt so anyway so you have this deep sand bed that you're looking at for a similar denitrification and you also are going to have fermentation happening. We also know through my videos that the last time I talked about it you're also going to have a negative redox. In other words you're going to have reduction state. Instead of an oxidation state because you now have no oxygen where you can't use oxidizers to break down insults you're going to have a reduction state because you have no oxygen. You cannot have an oxidation state in an oxygen-free zone. Okay? I think I explained that in other videos. So, I just want to make that real clear that anaerobic heterotrophs break down nitrates into nitrites and then again into ammonia. That is their end byproduct. Then, you have other problems start compounding 
which we call fermentation. You're not using your phosphates because they are very poor users of phosphates or phosphorus for energy. They do not use it as an energy source and you start building up phosphates. Another problem is, like I explained, fermentation. On the other hand, you have dissimilative denitrification, which would exist in anoxic zones or in a BCB basket. Now this is gets complicated because we know that uh, heterotrophic bacteria get carbon from uh, glucose, methane, sucrose, etc. Organic molecules, mineralization, and uh, cyanobacteria and stuff like that. Uh, Nitrification process are through audiotrophic bacteria. And they get their carbons from inorganic compounds. So we know that this bacteria lives quite nicely in our, in our substrates as long as oxygen levels remain high. And this has always been told to us because this came from sewage treatment plants. As long as that oxygen level in the substrate remains high, you have nitrosomatis aeropia and nitrobacter winogratzkii growing. Unfortunately, we come to a problem of as oxygen levels begin to drop, these two bacteria cannot live. And this is where we get into an anoxic zone. The good thing about this, if you can control that anoxic zone, then we have a bacteria that lives in it called facultative heterotrophic bacteria. This bacteria is very efficient at the use of phosphorus with only trace amounts of phosphates. The other thing that this bacteria is capable of doing is reducing nitrates back into a gaseous element, N2, which is called denitrification. N2 is what's in our air. 78% of our air is nitrogen. So it releases that back in and it gets out of the system because it's trying to equalize with the atmosphere. So that is a big, big plus. Like I've tried to explain to you, another big, big plus is that when you do create an oxic zone, you have another plus of putting negative and positive charges together to make radicals, hydroxyl radicals. And these radicals or oxidizing radicals that are used or make an oxidation state. We know that if your water column is uh, positive, and we know that your substrate is negatively charged, and if you could move those positive charges into the negative charges, like a plenum, for example, you will have negative and positive charges in the plenum. If these two charges unite, you have radicals. This is the reason why, I explain in other videos, why these radicals get released and help your fish, help your uh, uh, discus spawn constantly, help your goldfish spawn. In fact, this morning I got up, goldfish are chasing the female again, wanting to spawn. Uh, I've had people complain that that's all they're discus are doing is trying to spawn constantly. And this isn't just by one person. This is by several people having discus aquariums, <coughs> excuse me, you having discus aquariums complaining that their discus are constantly spawning. Now, 40 years ago, this was not possible, but now it is possible today by using an anoxic filtration system. We know this through the BCB baskets, do the same thing as using a plenum. So we now understand the sciences here and how it, how it works, okay? I'm not going to get into, into depth on this whole thing, but we know that people who 
use an anoxic filtration system, which you are seeing photographs here of people. All these photographs I'm showing you are of aquariums using a plenum. They're all using a plenum. And they all have high oxidization rates. Now, as a limnologist, when I go out and I check a lake or a pond, what is one of the things I check for? I have to check to see what is the redox or the oxygen level of the lake or pond that's at the very bottom. Do you have a redu uh, reducing or an oxidizing situation happening at the bottom of your pond. If you have a reducing, then we have to get more oxygen into that situation so we can have an oxidizing, an oxidation state where we can break down the leaves and stuff like that that are falling at the bottom of the pond or lake so we don't have a uh, death pond or death lake, if you understand what I mean. So that is up to the limnologist to find out what, what we want or what is going on. We want the same thing in our aquariums. If we make a shallow bed and have oxygen going in it, what we have found out is you have positive charges in the aquarium and you have positive charges in the substrate. Well, that doesn't really help us much, does it? It doesn't make those radicals like we want. And it doesn't make the oxi oxidation state the way we want it either. And we know that to make that oxidation state, like in salt water, a lot of people will use ozone, that extra molecule of oxygen, which is very unstable, which will attack proteins. But see, that's something nobody talks about. It's proteins. But if you have radicals in the aquarium, they will attack proteins. And this is one reason I believe the goldfish finally lived and why discus finally lived is because these are these proteins that we do not see we can't see them we can't hear them we don't even know there exists but they do exist because we see proteins at the top of our aquarium right you see that protein uh bubbles and stuff so we are using skimmers to try to mix those proteins together, right? So we don't see them floating to the top of the aquarium. Whether these proteins are coming from plant matter or whether these proteins are coming from fish matter, that is what we have to determine. A lot of them may come from food, fish matter. A lot may come from plant matter. Either way, you have abundance of these proteins that your aquatic animals don't like. And that's something they can't scream out and say, hey, you got this aquarium with too much protein in it. Get it out of here. I don't like it. But we could see that like with goldfish because goldfish always seem to end up with secondary problems. When proteins and other insults start increasing and we say we're doing everything right, what is wrong? Because you can't really see proteins, and if they're being mixed up in the aquarium some way, somehow, and they're not being utilized by anything, like by uh, radicals, then these proteins are going to keep building up, except through water changes. So it, it, uh, the chemistry starts getting a little more involved. But I wanted to make this video to let everybody know that anaerobic bacteria does more than just break down insults into nitrite. It will take nitrates and break it down to nitrites. But it also breaks it down into ammonia. That is its end byproduct. That's what causes fermentation. Okay, you have to understand that. If your plants aren't working right, if your system's not quite working right, if you have pockets of these fermentation pockets going on in your aquarium because you don't have enough plants or your plants aren't working or there's a rock there or stone there and the roots aren't there, you're going to come up with fermentation, which then produces other problems such as sulfate-reducing bacteria begin to grow and you get uh, methogenic bacteria that begin to grow.
Okay, so understand there's more to a anaerobic zone than what you think. So we need to keep the zone anoxic and stay away from an anaerobic zone because that is not the denitrification process we really want to happen. Yes, it will take nitrates, and the videos are absolutely right. Assimilatory denitrification, it will take nitrates, but it will reduce it back to ammonia. And that ammonia gets locked in there. And what can escape, like I said, then your oxygen zones where your audiotrophic bacteria are your uh, are that require oxygen, we'll have to try to break it down again back into nitrates. And, uh, you know, I always call that the monkey chase and the weasel. So that doesn't help us. And like I've told you before, plants can only use so much nitrates. That all would be dependent upon how much CO2 is in the aquarium, how much light do you have in the aquarium, how many plants you have in the aquarium. All this is going to be dependent on how you can get that ammonia out of the system. Like plants, plants take nitrates and convert it into nitrites and then again into ammonia, which is used by the plant for its amino acid and proteins. So we understand that they will have a two-step process the same as anaerobic bacteria has a two-step process of breaking down nitrates to nitrites and to ammonia, okay? So I saw that. I thought I'd make a video just to make sure you understand how the process is and how it really works. So you have kind of like three choices. You have one choice of a, of a sand bed or whatever. that has got to be very thin to keep it aerobic all the time, but you'll only have basically positive ions in the aquarium and in your situation in your substrate. We want to create a substrate of negative charges. This then will attract ions out of the aquarium water, such as the positive ions that are in there, instead of just having a positive charge and positive charge. You have to have and develop a positive charge in the water column, and you have to get your substrate or your BCB basket to turn negatively charged to attract ions out of the aquarium. And then, of course, in our aquarium, we make a plenum, which therefore has the positive and negative charges in it. And if these can bind together, you have radicals. Okay? I know this is kind of confusing. It's probably over a lot of people's head. But this is how things really work. This is what our microbiologists are learning in universities. Just what I have told you. This is how it works, and this is why it works, and this is what it does, and this is what we look for when we look at a lake or we look at a pond and it's not doing well, we are trying to find out what is really going on in the bottom of that lake or pond. And can we reverse it? And usually by adding an air stone, it can reverse the whole situation, get oxygen down there, and like I said, then can raise the redox to like 125 millivolts, which means we now have oxidizers, which means now we have the ability to break down leaves and sticks and anything else that's at the bottom of that lake or pond that you can't drudge out of the pond uh, by emptying the pond and cleaning the whole thing out, drudging everything out, and then refilling the pond, which does happen where ponds are completely empty and they have to be all cleaned out of all the buck because the pond or lake has died. We know this has happened. So anyway, I just want to make this, to make it kind of clear on this is what really happens. You do have choices on what you want to do. It's up to you. Like I said, we always have good, better, and best. You just choose which one you want, and it's your aquarium, your fish, and 
no matter how much you may think that what I'm talking is, is just nonsense, it doesn't work, but it does work. It's been proven to work. You can make anoxic conditions and you can use factutata bacteria that better, better utilize phosphates 30 times better than in an anaerobic zone. So factutata bacteria are able to use phosphates 30 times better. That's a big increase of using phosphates. Okay, and we know these factutated bacteria will use the oxygen from nitrates and they will use the oxygen from phosphates. So anyhow, I hope you enjoyed the video. I just wanted to make that clear. If you watch some of these videos, no, anaerobic bacteria does break down nitrates more than to nitrites. It breaks it down also into ammonia, which is the end byproduct. Okay, so until next time, this is Dr. Novak. Happy fish keeping, and thank you very for watching. Thank you very much for watching, and please uh, subscribe if you can. And thank you once again.